Buster. There's Maggie. And there's Miss Blue. Blueberry. And we're out here behind the cabin in this beautiful park. I don't know why they come out here and start chopping this wood. If they were going to burn it, you wouldn't think they'd make it in such nice little piles. I don't know what they're going to use that wood for. Anyway, it's a beautiful day. Oh my goodness, it's just beautiful. This is my little... Just like they hide everything. Like those cities that they burnt down that we were talking about yesterday. You know, our, our heritage. This is part of the remains of the ancient world. And you can go online and do some digging and find out that these ancient mounds were taken over by the individuals in the Civil War, made into forts. But this is, if you look at this, this area right here, this is a, a hill. This entire thing is not just natural, it's kind of a man-made mound and that was an ancient temple of some kind. Almost like a pyramid of some kind. We're not, you know, we're just looking at the remains. Guys, I have some uh, good information that I want to talk about today. I've been wanting, I said I wanted to talk about the Ajiji and who they were and the Anunnaki and all the deities and how man was created. Um, as I said the other day, man was not created in a test tube. But, you know, there's always, there's always other possibilities. I mean, there's layers of meaning, but I want to give you today the, the, the intended esoteric wisdom that one is supposed to Ooh, there's a little squirrel. That one is supposed to gather from meditation and prayer by reading the scriptures. They were written not as historical accounts. You really can't. It's impo almost impossible, I think, to write a book small enough for human beings to read in their lifetime that would give you the history of mankind for 234,000 years. Actually, 400. And uh, 54,000 years is our the, the history that we're given any indication about that's in the Bhagavad Gita and all of the ancient books <clears throat> but mankind as we understand humans probably started about 234,000 years ago but The story is an evolutionary process. It's symbolic of the way that human beings got here. And not just to tell us, oh yeah, we all evolved from nothing. But it's deeper than that. It's not, we didn't evolve, evolve from nothing. Our, the universe is, is, is far more complex and difficult to understand. That part is the, the mystery that we probably won't understand as long as we're human what our Heavenly Father is but whatever he is is us in our primordial existence we are the divine being and all of us are just children just little sparks of the divine And all of these ancient teachings, whether they're from the Bible or Samaria, or Babylon, Egypt, Mayans, Chinese or European or whatever, they were all stories to explain in shorthand 
sort of little myths that were told, oral teachings, stories of the creation, that at later times men, priests like Berosus of Babylon, Manito of Egypt, and Herodotus of the Greeks, would they were commissioned to, to write down a story. Well now, they didn't live back to 243,000 years. They couldn't write that story from like Luke did as an eyewitness. So it's different. The New Testament is different than all these other books. The Old Testament is a, is a Reader's Digest version of all the histories of the world. And it's symbolic. Most of it is symbolic, although there, you know, there are stories in kings of these individual kings and King David and King Solomon. They, they were real people. We have their ages, where they reigned, and we can go and dig up stones, archaeological stones today with David's name on it. We know that he was a real king. So we could, we have to imagine that some of the stories where it talks about David and where he ruled and how he unified the kingdom, that's true. But we also have to understand that the story of Bathsheba is, while it may have happened in some form, it's a little, it's written in poetic form and made to conform to an old myth, to retell an old story. So, for instance, Moses was put into a wicker basket and put into the marsh, and so was King Sargon. It's almost the same story. So in Assyria, where you know King Sargon was, just like King David, Moses. You know Moses was a pharaoh. There's Upper and Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt, Northern Egypt. Moses ruled over Northern Egypt all the way back from Abraham. So there were a group of pharaohs that ruled Northern Egypt. And from Abraham down, those are the mortal kings. Before Abraham, we have demigods, and before that, we have the gods that ruled the world. But they were real places and real people. So beautiful today. But Zeus is an ancient story, mostly mythological, and it bears a lot of esoteric wisdom. It's a story of evolution. It's a, it's a story that has this esoteric wisdom embedded in this mytho mythological story that may have been a real king, just like David was a real king, but they wrote a story about King David. So spiritual and physical, having a marriage, producing other, this produced other aspects of, of the universe, so depicting the universe as it advances and evolves. So we talk about the first father and mother, Absu and Tiamat. And we've already said that Absu means the abyss. And Tiamat, T is earth, and Mat is where we get the word math, mathematics. And it's also where we get the word matter. And it's very similar to the word mother, because even though it's not the word, root word of mother, there's another word, mommy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it has, it's related to that word. Because math and science comes from the feminine, just like Sophia, as wisdom, is a feminine. And material things are akin to science, the way things work. Consciousness. Ooh, look at that little turtle. It's so beautiful. 
You ever seen a turtle like that? Huh, that's a beautiful little guy. Hi, sweetheart. You stay away. Hi, sweetheart, stay away. Hmm. Oh my goodness. No, honey, no. I'm putting him back and let him go walking. You guys come follow me. We just wanted to see her beauty and say hello. I've got this big coat on. I'm going to have to stop and take it off. Kind of getting hot because it's not real cool out. It's kind of nice. Really nice, actually. It might be in the upper 60s or something. I don't know. I don't know what the temperature is, but it's just gorgeous out today. Woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, buddy. But anyway, so these all these stores, as I said before, they have layers of meanings. The first meaning is a is a, a deep esoteric wisdom of the universe. You know, grand, ageless principles, shall we say, that are being explained. Then there is another meaning, usually, to most of these stories. Uh oh, somebody's out here. I don't really know if I want to go and bother these people. Yeah, I guess we'll go back. Yeah, they're out there fishing. That's what they're doing. Well, I guess we're not going to be able to go to our favorite spot and finish talking about this, but we'll finish talking about it, of course. Um, we've got a beautiful big old park here with plenty of places to go. Um, I would feel a little bit odd standing next to, next to that fisherman talking about these things into the camera, but so I'll go over here. We'll talk about it. Um, these dogs eat everything they can find. Bones, feathers, and they just swallow it down. What are you doing up there, Miss Blueberry? Oh, they love their walks. So, I, I need to find a spot to sit down so we can talk. And maybe I could sit here on this little stump. Here comes Maggie. But it's not a real good spot to sit. <clears throat> get my coat off here. Be nice if that fisherman would just leave right now, but I don't want to disturb his fishing. I'm sure he's having a good time. Alright, we'll put the my coat there. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about Apsu. So the story of Apsu and Tiamat has very layers of, of meanings. We got the one that's the eternal principles, ageless eternal principles of, of the endless vastness of all things, you know, and, and these eternal axioms and, you know, like the deepest esoteric wisdom you could find. But then there might be... Now imagine that it's using literal props. So if Jesus had a story about a farmer that sowed some seed, well, this story's not really about a farmer that sowed seed into his field. But the story of the farmer sowing seed and how the seed grows and and all of that has to be true to start with. 
There has to be some truth to it in a literal sense. You can't talk about some spiritual truth and use an example of something you find literally if that what you're talking about literally is not true. So if seeds don't grow and they don't need sunshine and rain, then the story doesn't it's not gonna make any sense if you're trying to get some other higher esoteric wisdom out of it. So now you can liken the seed to something and the sunshine and the rain. to make a parable or an illustration. The literal part has to be true. So now when you're saying, you know, I'm gonna tell you a story about the universe. It's like a mommy and a daddy who have kids. Okay, well if mommies and daddies don't exist and if kids don't exist, if the travail of giving birth isn't real, then you can't imagine the travail of creation from our Heavenly Father and Divine Mother, the Earth. No, there is no, in that story, there is no divine person with a beard. So that the divine being is not a man with a great big beard, you know, an old aged man who sits up in yonder heavens. So now somebody who's maybe a secular priest or, or a dean at the University of Stanford or some atheist or ignorant poor soul who is being taught by the poor lacking Uh, wisdom that really can't be called wisdom at all but the logic that they are using their understanding which is faulty and and without all of the necessary points of understanding that would make it what we would say true it's not true because even though maybe somebody from Stanford could come pick up a few points from some parable in a book written by a Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh or, or uh, the Akkadian story of the Atrahasis, which is also a Babylonian story. They found it in both places. There's quite a few of these books that they've recovered and some of them are missing places and they can put it together. This Atrahasis, it's a creation story. But if they're reading it, I'm not saying that, that these learned men couldn't be possibly correct on a few things. Maybe dating, maybe they can interpret hieroglyphs, maybe, you know, they can do that. Maybe sometimes, who knows, they may get it right. They may interpret writing a certain way. And, and it may be right. It may be talking about a man drinking some coffee by a fireplace. And they interpreted this, this thing correctly. And, and they may see that there is symbolic meaning to it. So depending on how great your wisdom is, you may you may be able to see deeper into that picture and realize that that picture is not written thousands of years ago, chiseled into stone in these monuments, you know, for the entire world to know and buried like a treasure just to teach mankind a thousand years later that there was a man named Boohoo, you know, 14,000 B.C., who had a wife and couldn't keep her and put him in a pumpkin shell and there he kept her very well. That's not what the story is really about. However, because we understand human relationships and things, then we have to understand that there is some literalness to the story. And it could be a story about a man, at least, you know, if they're going to tell us how humans interacted at that time, maybe 15,000 years ago, we can gather some information, some literal information about the way people lived at that time, their habits. This is what a lot of scholars do. They're like, well, let's see, we've read this after a hasis and we've discovered that people had pottery and they were hunters and that's a lot of information. It's all true. But that's not the wisdom that we're looking for. Now they look at it and say, oh, you know what? It looks like it may be a, a parable about um, some uh, 
you know, wise saying to, to teach your children, you know, like Mother Goose, right? That, uh, always protect your kids and, and make sure that you don't leave your house, prote you know, unprotected because, you know, bears could come in and eat your porridge. That's another understanding that's there. The moral lesson, and I'm sure that they wrote those stories as moral lessons for people that lived in those days, although I don't think we would actually have to read thousand-year-old parables to get a moral lesson. Perhaps even today our morals may have even changed. Although, maybe it's a way for morals to remain, you know, so we don't forget the morals of our past and our, our grandparents that, who may have had more wisdom than we do. So we write our story of morality, you know, because today we might say, oh, we don't have to get married and we have to have monogamy and we don't have to raise families and, you know, we just do whatever we want and drink all day and eat pizza. Okay, well, we have to tell our stories to the children to, to show them what would happen if we went into... Uh, a lackadaisy lifestyle and everything fell apart and, and so we we could learn that maybe in ancient times they had certain morality for society and I think it's important then that we we don't forget the wisdom of the ages so there's that part so there's two right you've got this these eternal wise principles, maybe scientific principles of how the world was created, evolved from this chaos and from the great mother Tiamat, the great uh, solar system with the seven planets and the seven heads and, and therefore the Absu, which is, you know, the word we use today, abyss, could have originally meant the blackness of space. Because they might have thought that the water just went off into the horizon and then, you know, water came out of the sky, so there's water up there. There's waters above and waters beneath. And so the great ocean, I mean, there's two different kinds of water, right? There's the salty ocean water, and then there's the, the water that was, you could drink, the, the fresh water. Absu, they say, meant the fresh water. Well, what's the fresh water? Where does that come from? Well, there are springs of fresh water that come up from the ground. But most of the water, they noticed, like, where did it get there? Well, they noticed it came down from the sky, you know, and the raindrops, and the clouds, and the clouds looked like waves, and they didn't know really what they were. They didn't understand, probably, maybe originally, they didn't understand all these things. So for whatever reason, for we don't, okay, we're not gonna stand here and try to explain exactly what Absu means, but it has something to do with the water. And Tiamat has something to do with the mat, the material, the science, the math, who is mother, who is feminine. And so water and land, they come together, you know, and you get water on the land and things begin to grow. So this is science. This is science. But like I said, then we've got this other story. There may be a moral involved in the story. Now, what else might be involved? Well, there could be some literal history because now we're talking about particular kings that lived at a particular time. He had a, had a city that he built. We dug up the city. There's an actual city called Babylon. Now they're eating birds and, and everything else. They're just happy as little larks, huh? Okay, so, so there may be some literal history. We need to keep track of history. So I don't think they wrote stories about Babylon or Jerusalem or... Timbuktu or any other city that weren't that isn't somehow accurate that would somehow tell the uh, the culture the the place that they built the city why they built the city what family line built it what tribe these these are all facts they're going to be in the story they're not going to be false the Bible's not false the cuneiform tablets are not false. The Egyptian hieroglyphs are not false. They're stories. They're stories that tell um, real facts, real history. But now, does that mean that the first man, his name was Adam? You know, did Eve say, hey, Adam? You know, and, and Adam looked at Eve and said, hey, Eve. No, that's a language, and in that language, Adim comes from the word 
Adama, which is feminine, by the way, which is the earth. And Adam came from Adama. The male came from the female. So Adama was the holy mother and she gave birth. So he came from the soil, from the earth, out of her womb. Because the elements and everything, his form came out of, the, out of that. But he also had something else inside of him. He had a father. He had some airy, watery father. And these two somehow are all one. There's, a, there's this amazing wisdom principle. And, and if you really break it all down, it's probably talking about this amazing reality of the universe of evolution. But I want to point out that it is not necessarily trying to get across to you that, you know, when we say, well, it's about evolution, we're not saying, oh, yeah, okay, Darwin was right. You know, everything that here, that's here is nothing or it is something, whatever. We don't know what it is. You know, it's nothing, I guess, to them because there's no purpose. We can murder and pillage the earth. We can hurt one, one another. We can hate one another. We can, you know, lord it over others. We can, you know, we're not brothers and sisters. There's no point. So it's not like that. There's nothing wrong with evolution. Okay. When you understand what evolution is, a process, a divine plan, okay, it takes millions of years for us to learn all the things that we've got to learn. So there's no, no problem with that. We start off as babies. The Bible tells you that. So it's not about some, it's see, the divine being is dead. It's not about atheism. It's not about uh, nothing matters. It's not about a big bang. In other words, just physical things that blow up and there's no actual being. It's just programming. It's just uh, electrical force without any soul. There is no love. Love is just a concept. Really, there's, you know, that people are like saying, well, there's no, there's no real consciousness. We could make a computer and give it consciousness. We could give it a soul, you know. That's not what evolution means, that, that somehow we could evolve a computer. The humans, I mean, think about how, how these humans are making computers in a short period of time. And now that we have this knowledge of what, you know, I don't know who, obviously we're not going to get into who gave us this knowledge. But now that we have it, whoever gave it to us, we're, we're, we're making factories and we're building computers and we're programming them. And they seem to have great intelligence. We can push buttons. But still, somebody made the computer, somebody's pushing all the buttons, and every, all the information's programmed into it. So it's just, that's what a simulation is. But this universe is not a simulation. So let's get that straight. We're not talking about evolution from nothing. And so therefore, everything that exists is just an illusion. And there is no reality behind the illusion. The illusion's only here for us to play in, because we're real. We're beings. They, they don't really believe in the divine being. See, so if you really understand these ancient scriptures like the Bible, you're going to find out it is not talking about, oh, guess what? Some, some people got really smart thousands of years ago. They were smarter than us. They're just cycles. And, and they killed themselves because they're, they're, they're not deity and there is no one watching over them. And Jesus isn't coming back to save your soul, you fool. Right? There's no plan here. We're not going to all have immortality. It's just an endless uh, game that's futile. Okay? We just keep striving. You might as well go out and commit suicide or something, you know, because, you know, once you're gone, you're gone, you know, and, and why you're here, nobody knows and nobody cares. And there is no such thing as love, and nobody's going to come and save you. I have. We don't have a real Heavenly Father and a real Heavenly Mother. Well, Dave, you just said that our Heavenly Father is just the air, water, mist, or whatever. And our Mother is just this, this soil. Right? This is it. That's all there is. Well, why is it so beautiful? Right? Well, because it has a spirit. It has a mind. And that, that is the being. And this is just... The being's form, its outer form that it's taking and we're evolving. Our being is going through all these stages of awakening so that we can see the beauty and perceive 
the love that is here. So, I can see I'm in 30 minutes now. <laughs> I'm not even close to getting to the Iggy. So I might just sit here and talk for two or three hours until we finally get to what we're trying to say and do several videos and chop it up into hour lengths or something because I, I have a lot I want to say today and I'm not sure I'm going to get very far within an hour. But if I don't get it all spit out here in the next 30 minutes, which I can't see how I'm going to be able to do that, I'm going to go on and just keep talking. And we'll, we'll chop them up and load them up over the next couple of days. Because I, I'm, I'm, I've been telling you all the stuff I want to tell you and we just keep doing one hours and we get videos that just kind of go off into different, you know, pieces of this. And this whole thing about the Iggy and stuff, I want to get this out today. I want to make it clear that we were not made in a test tube by some astronauts. That's not what's about here. So... Jesus is a real person. And the New Testament is a little bit like the book of Kings. It talks about, you know, Luke says he's an historian. He's a real person. There are history books that talk about Pilate and Caesar. All the history books talk about John the Baptist. You know? All the history books talks about James, the brother of the Lord. The Essenes. And all the, you know, the Nazarenes, the Ebionites. Jerusalem. We can find all this information in histories. So the Bible's true, literally. There was a, an apostle named Paul who was changed his name to Saul, the son, when he became a Christian. And he went to Antioch, and they first were known as Christians, and the stories of Dan's boat going up there in the Swede Dan, and the struggle between good and evil, all this is real. Okay? So when the apostle Paul was writing... And he said, hey, those Judeans got a lot of fables. And don't take the thing literally, because that's the letter of the law that killeth. Did he mean that his own writings we shouldn't take literally? What kind of insanity would that make? If Paul is saying, don't take those mythologies literal, does he then mean, oh... So therefore, what I'm saying to you about not taking it literal, you don't have to believe what I'm saying because you can't even take what I'm saying literal. That's not what he's saying. Paul's a literal person, just like I'm a literal person and I'm talking to you guys. You should believe that I'm literally here and that I am literally telling you things that literally mean stuff. Okay, and Paul was a, a person and he met the Lord and he gave his witness, his testimony, and Jesus is real. The Old Testament's different. The New Testament's just a story about the coming of the Lord Jesus and, and the story of the apostles and spreading the gospel, which is a real thing. The coming salvation or the deliverance from the wrath that's coming and the explanation of this wrath and why we're going to have this wrath because you have to have the revealing of the son of destruction, the revealing of the man of sin, which is that part of us that we've got to reveal. We've got to grasp and understand and this of course takes us back then to the original primordial past that was written down in a poetic mythological form by different nations so the Babylonians have you know uh, Eridu and Inki do you know and the Gilgamesh and the, uh, their version of Noah is it the same person that we use to describe Noah, they're just calling it a different name, probably. When they describe creation from a person named Inky and named Herxag, who gets some bricks, seven bricks for males and seven bricks for females, and kill one of the gods... Yesuda or Yeshua or something of this nature and with his blood and his flesh they mix it into this clay and the Ijiji all spit into it and then they make seven males and seven females and they start this tradition of marriage and they tell how the marriage is going to be 
Are we talking about some deities, maybe some astronauts that came down and had some test tube baby and created human beings as we know it? Well, then who were the gods? And who are these? So these, these people that they're creating, man, is us. And we're just, we have no purpose again with that, with that understanding. Again, you're back to this Darwinism. It's a false understanding. You say, well, how do you know it's the correct understanding, Dave? And you can't just say, well, you know, you know and they don't know. Well, I'm telling you, the reason they don't know because they don't believe. They're atheists and they were programmed to teach this nonsense. But you, as an individual person, hey, guy, that guy that was fishing left, so I'm going to go over there and finish this little discussion over there. Hopefully we'll be able to finish what we're saying over here. Wow. Might rain here in a minute though. Looks like it's been raining pretty good. I heard it kind of sprinkling off and on this morning. even be a very good place to go fishing really but there's evidently some big fish in there because I see them jumping Hope he didn't catch a fish and gut it out and throw the guts out here or something because then the doggies will be after, after it. Alright. Okay. So, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lake, huh? Okay, so. Uh, what we were talking about is uh, trying to get into to the story and giving ourselves sort of a foundation uh, some talking points to have a basis for which to speak of these things like what are we describing we're describing some ancient books why did they write them what kind of wisdom were they trying to give us could they three four thousand years ago when they wrote these tablets and cuneiform and hieroglyphs could they have known the history of mankind for a million years no probably not unless of course it was divinely guided by some higher intelligence right or that human beings just lucked out and said you know what let's preserve these writings and bury them under pyramids let's build pyramids out of stones that weigh tons and and, you know, somehow they knew that thousands of years down the road, we would dig these things up and know about our past and they would write on them this great wisdom that somehow we, thousands of years later, would not know. Like, we would not know. We would be so materialistic and so disgusting and, and running around drinking and having orgies and, and we would forget all the ancient wisdom and they would, oh, we'd go back and look at the books and, oh, look at that. Is that what they were doing? They were this they were way smarter than we are, right? We're not so so we're not we're not evolving, we're we're degrading. And they somehow knew that they were so smart. So they wrote it down. Well they were so smart that they couldn't achieve salvation. They all died, right? 
if you're an atheist, that's what you would think. They all just, they were building these mud brick temples and, and slavery and they were just people and they were all, you know, I'm sure they had booze and parties and orgies too, right? But um, they didn't have the advancement, supposedly. Well, maybe they had more advancement. According to the story, Atlantis, they may have had far more advanced technologies than we do. But, you know, we don't know. But in your mind, you're thinking, okay, so these were primitive peoples, be it they, they had more morals than we do. And, and more, you know, some, some uh, genius within themselves to, to go through all the trouble to rear these magnificent temples. Well, of course, the, the, the scholars today would say, well, they reared them because they were making monuments to themselves. They wanted to be worshipped, right? It was all uh, greed and pomp and piousness, and they exalted themselves upon their thrones, and there's no gods. They were just kings that wanted to be worshipped. Huh? That all sounds like a pretty good idea there, except for the fact that you really think that a person that was that pompous and stupid that would that would enslave you know thousands and thousands of peoples into armies and fight other kings right and and that they were fighting only for for more women to have relations with or 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 to go get their food or, or their gold or something perhaps they were fighting a war of good and evil perhaps there was something evil they were fighting and perhaps these monuments weren't to edify or to glorify the cells. But perhaps they were to glorify the real deity that they were only embodying. Maybe they were. Maybe that's what the divine being is, is mind. And that divine being is what we all are. We are the literal temple of the living being. And so they made stories about how we're all the temple, but then they built the temple. And acted it all out in their little dramas, like King David and Bathsheba or whatever, to portray these great truths. But either way you look at it, none of this really makes sense that there's no purpose for man. And the more you think about, you know, what kind of brute, ignorant people that would be so pompous and proud that they would want other human beings, you know, with the flesh and blood and who die just like they do, to worship them. They were that degraded in their morality because we today know that's not moral pride. You know, we've got stories for thousands of years. They wrote stories about pride. You shouldn't have pride, right? They wrote these moral stories. So their king was, was not even, you know, was less moral than... Uh... Oh, looks like they're fighting over a bone. Hey, guys. <laughs> so, so they're so proud and immoral that, and, and debased mor morally that, that they enslave whole groups of people and murder and pillage and rape and genocide. But yet, they have this fortitude to build this temple that we can't build today. A science they've acquired that we can't master now, all these kings went through these schools, like Alexander went to the school of Aristotle, this philosophy, and they learned these great philosophies. And all they got out of it was, hey, now that I'm the king, I want you all to be subjugated and build me a big monument to myself. And then they died. And we get back and we dig it up thousands of years later and we see this monument. And we say, oh, wow, what does it mean? What is the meaning? Oh, Oh, the meaning is that some tyrant wanted to be worshipped. And he subjugated, enslaved everybody. And so that's why we've got this pyramid on the dollar bill. We're all going to be subjugated now. Well, that's possible, you might think. Except that if you really want to know the truth, you'll look into the mysteries behind that monument. You'll read the hieroglyphs, the writing on the wall. Daniel wasn't a fool. Daniel prophesied about all the kings of the world down to our day. He said, oh, well, there's no way to know if that's even a real prophecy and if it's ever going to happen. Well, 
maybe mankind's making it happen, but it seems to be happening. There's got to be some purpose to this world we're in here. And it seems to be tied up, intrinsically tied up in these monuments and these histories and then to the books that they wrote, that they cherished, that they usually put in you know, like the tablets of Moses that were put inside the ark overlaid with gold that had the, the wings of the cherubim and, and the seraphim hovering over the mercy seat, which had some mystery that was written about by priesthoods all the way down to Christ who came and died for your sins, but you don't understand it, so you say, pooey on it. You know, I'm going to remain an atheist. I think you should probably look into it. So today I want to tell you that while the story is telling us that there's an evolution, because I don't think anyone who reads the story about the great abyss having a relations with a seven-headed dragon, which probably is the solar system, and this other deity who splits the seven-headed dragon in two and makes the heavens from one part and the, the earth from the other part of her body. Could then imagine that that's God, that that's our father. You know, this heir is our father. But who then really is the divine being? Well, John 1.1, 1, 1. This, is, this is what you should consider. In the beginning was the word. Rocks don't have words. Humans have words. Speech. And the, the divine being said, let there be light. And it was so. And it came to be so. Which is the word amen. Let it be. So it was. And Hebrews says that the whole universe was framed by the, by the word of the divine being. And so here is the word, the logos, the exact representation of his very being. So if his very being is just some air and water mixed with some land, and over millions of years somehow you come out with an intelligent, that's, that's no different than a computer, right? You program it. You engineer it, program it, somehow or another, like a mirror, you, you, you reflect the light off of it and it shines into it and it goes down a tube and we figure out all the, you know, it's like the, the, the particulars of how light waves go through the air and that's pretty smart. And we're able to find out that everything that is physical has vibrations and all this stuff. When we build this computer, we plug it into the wall, we make factories and generators of energy and goes through the little thing and goes into the computer and we're able to to make motion pictures and put them into the you know into the memory into computer chips and into light waves recorded reflections little images i don't know pretty complicated isn't it and it acts like it works it's a simulation But there's no way for it to make itself. There's no way for it to answer the questions that you would need to ask unless you yourself could come up with the answers first and program it into the computer. So we're, we got this eternal circle. What came first, the chicken or the egg? What, is the universe really in, real? What is this battle with the gods? Well, I see... Part of what it's trying to tell you is that the physical universe does evolve. A child comes out of the womb, they've got no self-control. They have to learn self-control. We have to learn by the things that we, we suffer. So I guess there is some sort of an evolution. We're learning about how we get mad and we get a violent temper tantrum. We tear everything up and then we realize we wanted that now we've ruined it and we say oh next time i'm going to learn how to control my temper because i'm ruining stuff i got mad at my girl and i 
said things I shouldn't have said and she walked away and now I miss her. So we learn, right? And we don't do it again. Can computers learn? We don't know. Is that all the universe is? Where did it all come from? The answer to those questions are in those stories. And the answer to those questions, contrary to what these pompous, atheistic scholars of today, the greatest of their, you know, we went from Plato and Pythagoras down to today where we've got Darwin and Freud teaching us nonsense. And the truth is, is if you really look at history, it's kind of the same thing. you got to decipher it, just like we decipher these books. You find out that these people, you, you, you look at their genealogies and who they were, it's all one family. And they didn't actually interpret the wisdom and then tell us so we could learn, but they interpreted the wisdom and said, uh-oh, this wisdom's to help mankind become smart so that we could grow into becoming the sons of the divine being. So we don't want them to become the sons of the divine being. We want them to be our slaves. We want mankind, we want to rule over this. Keep that knowledge for us. So they started the Wilhelm Institute up there in Bavaria and they started talking to some beings that, you know, we'll talk about later, but called the demons, the devil. He has this plan. That's that childlike past that we had somehow supposed to have grown up and overcome. But now we're, we're going to say, you know what? We're wise enough to know that we've got to grow in order to have this advanced technology. But we've also got to be smart enough to know that if everybody learns this wisdom, then everybody will have this knowledge and we won't be king. They won't worship us anymore. You know, we'll have to go out and work for ourselves instead of sitting in, the, in this big gold throne and having them you know, order pizza and having them come deliver it to our door, these little grunts. See, So it's just a bunch of spoiled children that have found these ancient documents. They asked other people to go and figure out what they meant and they say, okay, good. Thanks for telling us that, that, that what these things mean. Now, in our degenerative egotism, we're going to keep that knowledge from them and rule over them. Because we're throwing our cares to the wind. We're sowing our oats. We're going to go ahead and make a pact. We know that what we're doing is wrong, but we're going to face the consequences one day. But we're going to have a big orgy and we're going to, you know, beat our fellow servants and hate them. And we're going to just have a big old time and a big party until Jesus comes back. But what happened over a period of time, they even forgot themselves what the truth was. Because they sat there eating pizza so much that they got so fat that they couldn't get out and exercise. And they didn't get any sunshine. And their cells began and they started interbreeding or whatever they did. And it made them stupid. So perhaps the whole world gets to this climax where we're, we're supposed to now understand this great wisdom. But at this point, our advancement has corrupted us. Is that a cycle that just keeps happening? We advance and then we get so corrupt by our wisdom that we just fall again? No, that's not it either. There's a true tale here that I want to explain. And the reason why I'm telling you they don't know the answer is because they have rejected the divine being. It tells you that. Paul, the apostle, and Peter and James, they said that they would have teachings of demons and that, that we would have to one day have this great revealing of this man of sin, which is this egotistical nature. We've got to find out who that is. Well, that's the, the son of destruction that must be destroyed. And once that son of destruction is destroyed and sent into the bottomless pit, and the, the key is inserted and we've locked him away, it'll never come out. And mankind can go on because we'll have overcome the wicked one. So Jesus came to overcome the wicked one. So there is a wicked one. And there is a thing as the immortality. And there is this glorious existence that we're going to have. But you got 
to not believe these idiots who want you to to be their slaves and they don't want you to know about it. You can't believe them. You got to go and read it for yourself. And have enough faith to seek that you might find. So, we get down. So, who, who is the Anunnaki? Well, we said the other day when we were out here that there are eight Anunnaki. There's a symbol. It's like a circle. Okay. I mean, it's this, this shape of a circle. But it's got these little eight lines going out from the center. Four of these lines on this top side, the end has a little triangle. And on the bottom, they're just straight lines. So there are four that are different than the other four. And those eight are the eight souls that got in the, the ark and made it through the flood. And they're the Anunnaki. As we said before, the, An, the, the original, they're called the divine beings from Anu, sons of Anu or Noah. And they're called that because they're all children, literally, of Anu, of Noah. And there were eight of them. And there were four women and there were four men. And so remember now, when Noah, it tells you in the Bible, when Noah was 600, the flood came. But when he was 500 years old, he had, it says he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he may have started having them and every year or two, they're all close to the same age, but somewhere around a hundred years, according to our Bible, they, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives lived before the flood. So all eight of these lived before the flood. Noah lived 600 years, according to our chronology. And Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives all lived at least a hundred years. But as we've said, that's coded. It's symbolic. There's parts of it symbolic, parts of it that's actually real. In the symbolic part, you have to understand that the same story is told by the Egyptians and the Sumerians, and they use longer dates. So that from our flood to back to creation had to have been a hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, not just uh, 1,600 years, or even like the Septuagint says. 2,300 and something. It was much longer. So Adam lived for thousands of years and reigned. And Seth ruled for thousands of years and he reigned. And Enosh ruled for thousands of years and he reigned. And uh, this goes down to the seventh person, which is Enoch. You got Mahalel Mahel and, and then Enoch. And Enoch, it said, lived for 365 days. We said that's symbolic of the time, it's the whole cycle that it takes to go around the sun, 365 days. So it's symbolic of some sort of, some sort of astrological information, this deep information that probably if we were to figure out all of this information that's encoded there, we would just been here a uh, week of Sundays trying to understand all this. But we, we, we're gathering what we can, right? We're putting as much of this information that the Lord's giving us together and it's making a very uh, interesting story. So Enoch, it says in the book of Jubilees, he built a city. And there were about 144,000 individuals there that all went up with Enoch into the air. And right after that, Enoch's son, Methuselah, has Lamech, and Lamech has Noah. And there's about 600 years till the flood in our chronology. Probably was thousands of years. So you imagine that Noah and the Shem, Ham, and Japheth were like divine beings. They lived for thousands of years. They were literally Anunnaki or the sons of Noah. And they lived in the days of Atlanta for thousands of years. So where was Atlantis? So Atlantis is beyond the Atlantic. And as I've said, it's in a place we call America today. Adam dwelt and reigned and his throne was in a little place in North America right near the... Missouri, Iowa border, or I think somewhere in there, or kind of around Kansas City. This is the original 
place where Adam dwelt. And he reigned there for thousands of years. And Seth reigned there for thousands of years. And Enos reigned there for thousands of years. And they were the divine beings. <clears throat> the Elohim. The, you know, the deities. And then it gets all the way down to Enoch and they were taken off the earth. And this was in America. Well now, there's this child called Poseidon that has ten titans. He's got the, the tridents. He's like the devil, right? He rules over the sea in the Greek mythology. Well, in the Bible, Noah has a son named Japheth, which is Ipetus, which is uh, Op. Opetus or Poseidon. It's the same person. We know this from parallels in different books and stories. Sometimes they call him Poseidon, sometimes Ipetus, and Ipetus is another spelling for, in the Latin, for Japheth. So Japheth is Poseidon. And so Japheth lived in, in the days of Atlantis for thousands of years, and he had ten kings. They were the Titans. Now the reason they're called Titans and not the divine beings is because they weren't fully divine because they married a mortal. Who are the, who is the mortal? Well, the mortal, I'm going to tell you, but then I'll tell you why we know. The mortal is the children from Cain. You see, in the Sumerian tablets and the Babylonian tablets, it tells us about, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it tells us about this, this well, in another story it calls him Enkidu. Okay, there's our Inky, right? Inky do. And it's really Cain, okay, in the story. Our Bible, Cain kills his brother Abel, and Cain is a wild man, and he goes to the land of Nod, which we find out in Hebrew means he was a wanderer, a fugitive. So he, he, he wandered the earth like a wild man. Well, that's the story of Inky do, the wild man. This crazy wild man that roamed the earth. And the other guy who reigned, you know, in the city. Now, he ruled in the city of Eden. Eden was in America. Well, our Bible tells us that Cain went, after he was punished, to wander. Said he went out eastward of Eden. Well, east of America is, you know, Europe and the Middle East. Well, it says he arrived in a place called Nippur, uh, Ur, that area over there, they built this, it says eventually Cain went out and he, his son Enoch, it's all backwards, you know, the seventh in line from Adam is Enoch on Seth's line, but on Cain's line, Cain has the firstborn son is Enoch, and he builds a city. So in the story with the Sumerians, this wild crazy guy wanders eastward, and he ends up building a city. Somehow or another, he becomes intelligent enough that he begins to build a city. Well, in the story, he was kind of like the slave to the more civilized individuals. So, Atlantis had these other beings, the wanderer, the fugitives, the wild men, the lowly little peons that did all the work. But all the way until, you know, after Thoth left, which is Enoch, then something happened to Atlantis, right? Noah's son, Japheth, ends up marrying one of the children of, of, of Cain, one of these wanderer wild men, and ended up making this titan, and then he had ten of these in succession, and they took over Atlantis, and this is why Atlantis fell, and there was this great flood, and then that's the story of Noah and his three sons that are thousands of years old by this point. The eight Anunnaki, sons of Anu, that get through the flood. But it says, so, so then who is this creation man? Well, it says they make seven bricks. There's seven bricks that are males and seven pieces of clay, I guess, that are females. What could that mean? Seven males and seven females that are made out of earth, clay. Well, remember there are seven, and, and remember, who's making the seven? It's a woman called the dragon mother, or Naama, 
you know. And Naamah is in our Bible. Naamah is the is the, the the lineal descendant, the female lineal descendant of Cain. She gets through the flood because you know Noah has her as his concubine. So she's got the genealogy of the wandering fugitives, the laborers, the concubines, the slaves. And because one of the sons ends up, you know, having relations with this woman, well, this produced these titans. So all of them had to be wiped out, but in the story of Poseidon, he ends up, his last kid is Magog, Gog of Magog. Gog of Magog comes out of the bottom's pit in the Bible. So that's the demons that are going to rule over the world. They don't actually come back as humans, but they come back as demons out of the bottom's pit, out of the subconscious realm, and they're like these demons that are going to rule the world and plague the world. So what are these seven that this dragon mother makes? Well, she's got seven planets. She's she's uh, the woman that sits on seven heads. She's the mother that's got these seven. And these seven are seven planets when they're also seven subtle bodies. And each planet has two, a male and a female that rule. And those are the, so we all have the seven subtle bodies. So they were creating man, they were creating us. And we all have the seven male and the seven female within us. And we graduate in this evolutionary process that we were talking about. So this is a big esoteric story to teach how mankind was evolved and how we have these esoteric subtle bodies the conscious mind the super conscious the, there's, there's various conscious layers and realms you can also look at it that if Absu is the sky or something and and the clouds of water and the waters above and stuff and it's hard to dogs are just having a good old time here. And um, time has just the solar system. And they split the solar system. And this is talking about a, an ageless, primordial time when the universe evolved and exploded and it came into being, right? Well, then that's not talking about some person that's on the earth that's a human. That's, that's a primordial, you know, deep esoteric teaching. But we can go up a little further. Remember, we got these layers. We can also say that on Earth itself, you get the great ocean, or the abyss, the Absu, and then you've got the seven continents, or mat, the material, the Earth. And when the material Earth meets the surging waters of the ocean, they give birth to plants and things, and the sun and the moon and the and trees and rocks and mountains and all of the other deities began to form. So what is this? Well, all of these things in the universe, Mother Tiamat, Mother Earth and Father Sea or whatever, right? You see that on the Aquaman or, you know, the Poseidon or, what, you know, the Father. They create or evolve in seven stages the spirit of man. And the Bible we've got just explains it that Adam is the embodiment. Adim is plural. Male and female he had within himself as a one. As one. And the whole universe and he was the, the, to have dominion over all of it. And then it's this other deity, Yahweh, which is the lower ego that is in the you know, so, so you've got the, the duality, you've got the male, the female, that's in everything. Even though originally it's all one, one universe. But you divide it up into male and female, all the way down. So you've got the sky and you've got the solar system. And the Ijiji is all the stars. There's multitudes of them. But still no humans, because you need physical bodies on Earth for, these, for the spirit of the universe to come in. And as 
spirit as individuals we've got to migrate through all the fish birds mammals and men we've got to understand minerals we've got to uh, we've got to become all of this oneness is going to be the spirit that inhabits this new creation the crowning creation of all of the meaning as it evolves it gets down to this thing called adam and adam is the crowning of the creation and it all dwells in him bodily He's the exact representation of the entire universal. The universe is just, um, it's got the outer manifestation of, of his thoughts, his body, his, his woman, his mat. And the universe has got the mind. It's a one being. It's real. It has a, a thought process. It has consciousness. It's love. It's the universe. Okay. But it's, it's in its glory and it's one and it, it doesn't understand itself yet. It wants to see itself and it wants to experience and it wants to have adventure. So like we talked about, you have to have a mirror to see yourself. So the universe splits itself in half, becomes male and female. And this is Ab Absu and Tiamat. And then they evolve the seven suns and the seven existences and the heavens and the earth, the male and the female. But on the earth is this man that embodies it all. And he sees all the animals, which is the zodiac. And he, he know he aim, he, 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 um, he counts them, he numbers them, he identifies them, he names them. He, he, he's in this little garden. So in some sense, that garden is the physical universe and all the natures and all the trees and all the animals and all the characters that Adam then, being the mind or the thinker, is experiencing his thoughts and understandings and his natures and he's knowing them and having, he's uh, gaining dominion over himself. These are all extensions of himself. But by virtue of this separation, you know, because if, if the divine being had stayed one, it would just remain one and wouldn't have any experiences and knowledge of itself, right? So it, it split itself in two. And by that, it is able to have children. So it has this child, Cain and Abel. Well, they're dual. One's good and one's bad. Abel is the higher and Cain is the lower ego. So... The wild man, the earthly, the wanderer. So, not only is it something esoteric principles of agelessness, it's also a story then about mankind. Because there was a civilization ruled by men that we're going to call Adam. Was there ever a man the very, very first man that you could say that is Adam and he was made from dust. You know, God came down with a little toolkit and, you know, and made this and sculpted him. And no, that's not a literal story. Okay. He was made by the higher principles of Absu and Tiamat, the universe. He evolved. So then he's standing there and his first son is would be a complete replica of himself. But, again, it's got to be cut in half and it's got to be ferreted out so that we understand that there is the lower ego and there is the higher. So Cain is this lower ego that hates or that is angry you know the anger resides in the lower part of the, of our being and it's angry so it's jealous and what happens well in its jealousy it became blind you heard a blind rage and it killed his brothers brothers the higher so now mankind is this is the story of how mankind got into this situation where we're blind because we had that lower ego, but it, what we were, we didn't know how to control it. We didn't know how to 
to use it properly, you know, we have a fist and it's very powerful and you can hit things, but if you don't know how to use it, you can break things. So we have the lower ego and there's nothing wrong with the lower ego. Cain, that's why in the Bible, Cain's not murdered, killed or sent to hell or whatever, but he's just, he's just, you know, marked. He's a wild man. Be careful. He might kill somebody, you know? And so he's got to go out there to wander. He can't be in the city like Inky Do. He's a wandering wild man. It's the story of Gilgamesh. So he's sent out from America. And he goes eastward and he comes to the area around Babylon. And he makes a city. So originally Babylon is the city of Cain. That's the Enoch there. That's the western side. And again, it, it's more symbolism. This circle of rebirth. You've got the horizon on two sides where the sun goes up and then the, comes back around on the other side and the sun goes down. So there's a city built on this side, which is the good side city, city of light. And then there's the city of Cain's on the other side, which is as you're going down into the darkness. This, there's the two principles, the divine father and mother that give birth to the son. And the son is the savior. The son is that part that's the grand, it's, it's, it, it embodies everything the mother and the father has, but it's now the exact representation. It's come to light and mommy and daddy can look down at their child and they, and they can smile and they say, that's our baby. And, and that child's worth more than everything. It's even more important in their own lives. That son, Jesus, is more important than their own lives. You know, you don't have to earn salvation. Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother love you, their own child, more than they love themselves. They, there's no way on this, in this universe that they could ever, they would suspend all the laws of reality and, and, and science to make sure that your soul was saved because you're their child. They'll cause you to... Walk on water rather than sink and drown. They'll, they'll give you buoyancy like a, a balloon so that you can not fall and, and bruise your foot upon a stone. They, they will do whatever it takes. But at the same time, because they love you, they gave their only begotten. They gave you. You're their only begotten, the real creation. You're, you're the child. You're able. They let you die because they also know that you've got these other parts of you that create this world, the tools. You need those tools. You need these, the beauty, the mother, the other half. You guys gotta get along. And so it's gonna take time and learning. So, so time comes from time at too. You know, earth and matter is where time gets involved. Once you get time involved, now you've got space. Space and time, which is which is con, which puts the universe that everywhere and nowhere and, 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 it, at, and at all times, because there is no time and space. But we chop it up into little thing concepts of time and space so we can understand it. You know, we dwell as different individuals in different spaces and different bodies at different times. And we live different experiences. So as the divine being that we all are, we can experience ourselves both as male and female. At both polarities, as trees, as fish, as water. So this is, you yourself are the entire universe. But you don't want to be the entire universe all at once, do you? You want to just be you, the sun. You don't want to be mommy and daddy. You want to be the sun and go play. The sun goes out the door and he runs out there and he plays. And he's frolicking, he's just enjoying, and he's pretending, and he's, oh, he's, a, he's happy. But one day he'll grow up to be a divine being. So notice when Tiamat, the mother, she makes these seven clays. So, 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 so who are the Gilgamesh? Well, remember, Enkidu, uh, let's see, in our Bible, Cain goes to Nod. Well, one of the names of this Enkidu is uh, Nudumud, Nudumud, and that's all under the name of Enki, Nudumud. 
And knew the mother, Inky, is the one that makes man. And that's the same as Cain, in Cain. You know, in, in is A-N-K-I. And if you put the K-I first and the A-N last, it's Cain. It's really the same person, or his son Enoch. It's just continuation of the same process, the lower wild man, all the way down to his, you know, and, and, and he produces the Ijiji, because they were the, the ones that were doing all the labor. Okay, they weren't the Anunnaki or the sons of Anu. Right? So when Poseidon had a re relations with one of the, the mortals, it was one of the children of the wild men of, of Cain. And they produced the Ijiji and they did all the labor. Well, eventually the people that were doing all the labor, the ego, got tired and resentful. The ego gets tired of doing everything. See, and just like Cain who killed his brother Abel because he was blind, well, the Ijiji, they're strong and they could, you know, that's the physical. But the physical doesn't want to just work. They want purpose. They want their brother back. See? So, um, so one of the divine beings that marries one of the Ijiji ends up making this giant and you know you probably heard in this in the uh, epic of Gilgamesh and, and and some of these versions of the story that they've dug up about Enkidu and stuff he ends up becoming tamed by marrying this particular woman they give him a wife and then he becomes Amazing and they end up doing things together and building a city and and he he becomes friends with the the other lineage of the kings So there's a lot in there, but it appears that in most of the stories when they brought forth these children with the children of Cain the Distorted physical, the 666, the fingers with six fingers and six toes and the giants and all that, is a sort of a symbol of the fact that, that, that the children then became more materialistic. And they were then not only good workers, but they got angry a lot too. And they would have a war with the good side because they were more materialistic. So it's kind of like a story of the saying that that once we began to entertain higher wisdom and grow and merge with our lower self and higher self, that the lower self was, was in a physical sense, very dangerous. And we would build big cities and then it would crash and fall down. And because we, we hadn't yet made the great marriage that, you know, King Solomon did with Bathsheba. And made the unity. Remember what the, when he married Queen Asheba, and he had the unity. Well, it says that he began to fall into idolatry. Why? Because the he did not yet know how to remain as Solomon faithful. He, you know, we have to understand that that we can experience the physical pleasures. We can eat food, but we can't be a glutton. We can have a glass of wine, maybe, or, or something, or a glass of beer, or, or whatever, but we have to not be a glutton or, or a drunkard. We have to gain the mastery. So the story about the man and the woman, and the man being the head of the, of the, of the wife, well, you see, what happens is, is that you can't have either one of them really being the head. You have to be in unity. And so neither is the man without the woman, or the woman without the man. Yeah, for a long time the woman was the slave and he was veiled. We didn't understand that part of it. Then they opened it up and whoa, there's the woman. And we have this big, you know, fight and we start, we're not getting along because we don't know how to get along. So we have to, so the man has to become a bigger man. You know, he has to be able to recognize the beauty. He has to be able to, to take care of his wife and love her as his own flesh. So these are the principles we couldn't learn right away, you see. We couldn't learn this right away. So, 
Cain and Abel just couldn't get along because it isn't all Cain's fault, you know? It was also maybe a little bit at Abel's fault because, you know, if Abel was the wiser, he maybe could have uh, you know, learned how to love his brother more and listen more and and lead rather than try to make laws and control or something. There, there's a lot of wisdom that we could pull out of there. But what we know is, is that because they began to have relations with the children of Cain, there was wickedness in the earth and giants in the earth because Cain's seed was the physical, the gigantic, the, you know, I don't even know, you know, they say there were giants. They dug up giants, so they may have been real giants. Goliath was 12, 13 feet tall, and we've got all Queen of Bashan that might have been like 10, 11, 12 feet tall or something. So they say that some of these beings could have really been tall, more more sort of uh, six fingers and six hands, kind of kind of accentuated into the material, physical giant kind of thing. This may have meant that they were more sexual too. That maybe that they were more angry. Maybe that they uh, were like warriors and stuff. And maybe maybe they were, you know, because you notice that Uriah was a giant, and David used him in his army. So they were using these giants, and Yahweh in his law. He was going to fix it by saying, you want to wipe them out, kill them. Well, that's not going to help either. Man and woman, they're, getting, they're not getting along. So if one side just kills the other side, well, no more arguments, right? But you see, then you realize you need, both of you need each other. So the great union or the great wedding has got to come. And so this is why it was a woman from Cain's line that went through and married Noah who was from Seth's line. They got married, but that wasn't the end of it. They still had more evolution. They still had to, you know, uh, at that point, they didn't know how to deal with the union, right? And so then the flood came. So this is what this is all about. And I think we got to go into it more in depth. You know, we can't just tell the story like that. I've just sort of given an overview, but like I said, tomorrow we'll Hopefully, maybe I can sit down and do another video on this and put forth some more of these points in a more logical and cohesive way and put some pictures in the background and explain this history, maybe go through the atrahasis and where it talks about the seven pieces of clay that were male and the seven that were female. Hey guys, um, I ended up had getting a phone call right there and I hung up. So anyway, <laughs> I'm already an hour and a half. So sorry that I've gone so long today. I hope you didn't mind and hope you were able to watch till the end here. But anyway, I'm going to clo close it here and let you guys go and we'll talk about this more tomorrow. Hope you have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.